Lead Time is a podcast of the Unite Leadership Collective, hosted by Tim Allman and Jack Kalliberg. Lead Time taps into biblical wisdom for practical solutions to today's burning issues. Each podcast confronts real-time struggles facing the local church in a post-Christian culture. Step into the action with the ULC at uniteleadership.org. This is Lead Time. Welcome to Lead Time. Tim Allman here with uh, Pastor Reverend Christian Preuss. Now, Christian, as you and I are chatting today, I had an opportunity a couple, three weeks ago to interview uh, Mr. Christian Preuss, who is the attorney and kind of leader of the 703 Task Force, I think now the 704 Task Force for uh, the Concordia University system. How are you connected? First, like there are so many Preusses in the family of faith in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. So yeah, make some of those connections. And then uh, Jack Price, uh, J.O. Price's son, is a good friend of mine here, a member of our congregation here at Christ Greenfield. So, yeah, there's so many Christian Prices. Can't have yeah. enough, man. Thanks so for Jack hanging today, Price, bro. Uh, who's, who's a member at your congregation, would be my second cousin. Second cousin. And uh, his father, may he rest in peace, mm-hmm. would be my, my dad's cousin. Um, so uh, Jack Price, boy, what a gentleman, what a wonderful man that God... Uh, recently took to heaven and thank you mm. for your pastoral care for him um it was an honor, and man. for his and for his wife and his whole family um oh, christian is my uncle okay um and my godfather actually is that right so <laughs> yeah were you kind of named after him do you think or i don't know uh I, it's a good name regardless, but uh, regardless, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So tell me as we head in today, thanks for your generosity of time. This is going to be a fun chat. Uh, tell me how you got into pastoral ministry, what that, you know, internal then external call upon your life was uh, ratified by the church. Yeah. Bring us into that, that call. Cause my, my, you, you and I are just getting to know one another. I kind of had that internal sense as I watched my dad, you know, so many pastors mm-hmm. around me, third generation LCMS pastor. It was confirmation, man, that was super formative for me. Mm -hmm. Um, Having to get in front of the congregation and answer, do the question and answers with four different confirmands in a smaller church in El Paso, Texas. I was like, this is intense and it's super fun (laughs) to talk about Jesus in front of the body of Christ. So that's a little bit of my kind of origin story of pastoral formation. What's yours, bro? So for as long as I remembered, I wanted to be a pastor. So like my kindergarten pitcher, um, my friends were like, you know, they're carrying garbage, garbage bags saying, Oh, I want to be a, a, a garbage man. And, or, you know, wearing a, 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 a helmet and saying they want to be a fireman or whatever. And my right. picture is with me in a tie, uh, in the, in the pulpit <laughs> or the lectern. Right. Love um, it. now, so I, I pursued that. And then, um, I went to college early actually, uh, and, uh, th- that was instigated by the fact that I, I, I broke my knee and I couldn't do sports anymore. I was a big jock. And, uh, so I was like, why stay in high school? So I went to college early, ended up graduating at age 20 and I was terrified to go to seminary. From you where, know? where did you go to college? Um, at first I went to Bethany Lutheran college Okay. and, uh, in Mankato, Minnesota, um, I didn't grow up in the EL or in the LCMS. I grew up in the ELS, which is a tiny little Norwegian synod right. that's affiliated with uh, the Wells, Wells, the Wisconsin synod. Yeah. So um, I went to that college, but they didn't have a classics program. So I couldn't take any more Latin, couldn't take any more Greek there. So I transferred to the University of North Dakota. And I, uh, as you can see by my accent, I graduated from North, North Dakota. Dakota and <laughs> um, in, in classics in Latin and Greek. And I was 20, terrified to go to seminary uh, because I didn't want to be a pastor at age 24. And so um, I decided to uh, apply for a a master's degree in uh, Latin and Greek. And that was at the University of Iowa. And when I came, they said, well, why don't you just stay for your PhD? So I stayed for my PhD there. So I was there for six years. Wow. And during that time, actually, I... um, started wanting to be a professor and kind of changed my plan. And I was in the process actually of applying to Concordia Irvine. Um, okay. I'd sent letters of recommendation there and so forth. And then I had a talk with my wife 
And uh, my wife said, I'm sick of you in a very nice way. She said, I'm, I'm, so, I'm sick of you just reading, <laughs> you know, Greek rhetoric um, and having nothing to talk about. I miss the guy who wanted to be a pastor and who was really excited about God's word and spreading the gospel. Mm-hmm. And that decided it for me. Um, and I instead, I stopped the application process and applied to Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne. Mm-hmm. And... Um, even during that time, I was like, no, I kind of want to be a professor. I kind of want to be a professor. And then it was really the uh, vicarage experience that solidified it for me. I was like, no, yeah, no, that no. At? I yeah. want to be a pastor. That was in Lincoln, Nebraska okay. under uh, Reverend Clint Poppy. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, quite a great guy, quite the personality, uh, an, an amazing uh, and effective pastor. And... Uh, and oh my, did he make me work? Uh, was long ministry constantly. there, right? Poppy's and, had a long ministry there, right? Oh yeah, I think yeah. so. He's retiring this year. And I think he's been there for twenty five years or so. Talk about what he taught you in terms of preaching. Sorry to cut you off. Oh well, oh he it, it drove me crazy. So he wouldn't <laughs> he wouldn't let you look down, right? So uh, it was either go up there without a manuscript or memorize that manuscript. And so he really stressed eye contact. Um, and I had the, you know, the, 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 the theological grounding, I could write a sermon and so forth, but actually being able to communicate it uh, mm-hmm. to the people and uh, realizing just how much it matters that you're looking them in the eye when you preach mm-hmm. the law and preach the gospel. Amen. Um, that you have this, what Fort Wayne would call incarnate, incarnational reality, right? Mm -hmm. Um, that we are people and, um, it's one thing to have someone read, uh, something to you. It's another thing to have someone preach it to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so he really instilled that in me and, uh, it was, it was a beautiful thing. It got me out of uh, my shell and, uh, but especially just his love uh, for the people um, and made me realize that this is what I wanted to do, that there's no higher calling than the pastoral office. I'd heard people say that and I'm like, come on, give me a break. I want to be a professor. Um, mm. and, and then I was finally convinced in my heart, uh, which is wonderful because it made my fourth year, just a, such a wonderful time looking forward to being called in the pastoral ministry. And mm. you're right. You have that external call, you have the internal call. And when those match up, um, and you're really, really excited about preaching, uh, God's word to God's people. It is such a beautiful thing. Amen. And where have you served, Christian? Tell me your just here at story. Mount Hope yeah. Lutheran. Yeah. So right out of seminary, called to Mount Hope. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you've been there now over a decade. Seven years. It's just, okay. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Going on eight. Uh, now. What? Pra- praise God. What's giving you the most joy in ministry? Oh, what's giving me the most joy in ministry? It's hard. I mean. It's just a constant series of joys. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I could, I guess, apply it to my own family to be able to catechize my own children and to see them um, faithful um, and loving the Lord Jesus and faithful to his word and wanting to learn more and more even after confirmation. Yeah. That's just been amazing. Also, um, I think seeing so many families um, in the church and joining the church and seeing Christian culture spread Mm. um, so that we actually get together. We're actually talking theology. People are asking, hey, what can I do at home? Um, You know, as far as devotions and singing hymns and things like that. And Mm. to see that what is happening at church is also going out into, uh, into the homes and then coming back and making the church even better. Uh, it's just a, uh, it's been a wonderful thing. Oh man, there's so much, there's so much there. Uh, I mean, first for listeners, for those of you who don't know, uh, Christian has nine children, 15 years old, down to seven month year old. Uh, praise, praise be to God. And uh, catechesis in the home, such a huge thing. I think a lot of times, maybe even pastors, this is lead time. Many pastors listen to this, right? Many pastors maybe even outsource catechesis to yeah. the church, right? Yeah. 
Um, what does catechesis look like in in your home, brother? With your so kids at the various ages, stages. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, catechesis in my home is, for one thing, like a lot of it's just informal. It's just what we do because we're around a table. Uh, so it's a culture, it's always, a culture of your home. It's a culture it's, of your home, right? Amen. Exactly. So we're, we're around a table every single meal. Uh, I shouldn't say every single meal cause I don't eat breakfast. Um, <laughs> but every supper, we're definitely around a table and that will then involve us talking about the day, talking about problems and so forth. And God uh, enjoys and God always comes into the picture. And then at the end, there's a Bible reading. Um, because my kids are, are younger, um, we almost always do either the Gospels or other histories because people can understand them better. Um, like trying to read through the Psalms or trying to read through the Proverbs is going to go far, uh, far over the heads of a five-year-old. Mm -hmm. Not that you can't do that, but we do, we do the histories. And then uh, we always sing hymns. So my kids have dozens of hymns memorized um, and they love them and they sing them in the shower. And then uh, also for bedtime, we, we do the same sort of thing. And um, again, it, it can be like very informal. Like we're reading right now, uh, James Harriet. I don't know if you've uh, heard of his tell stories, no, but he me. was a veterinary, uh, veterinary surgeon in England for like 50 years. And he wrote, mm -hmm. he's an amazing writer and he has all of these stories that he writes uh, and they're fun. And it's just a family time that we're reading. We've, we've also read through like Tolkien and things like that during these, um, d during bedtime. And just having that family time, even if it's not explicitly religious, is itself a religious phenomenon because you're mm -hmm. upholding the family, we're a unit. And then that leads into maybe some more Bible reading prayers, which are both, you know, Luther's evening prayer, the Lord's prayer, but also our personal petitions. And then uh, another hymn, almost every night we sing on my heart in print thine image. Mm. So good. Uh, for a lot of people that listen, this seems like old school Christian, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, the world, the world is so digital and we're so distracted, and I think Satan wants to divide. Well, he is the liar that wants to steal, kill, destroy, divide, like the base of what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, God created male and female, and and then said, be fruitful and multiply, right? And he is attacking, Satan is attacking the Christian home today. And we may get into some points of conversation today, Christian, that I may disagree or disagree agreeably, whatever, which goes to J.O. Price. Like we may have some differences of opinion regarding like how the church goes on mission, for instance. Okay. Uh, what that, what that looks like. But I think our greatest point of unity on the very small spectrum of mission or confession, which we're all confessional Lutherans on mission to make Jesus known. And, and we're kind of straining gnats in many respects, uh, even as we head into the synodical convention. And it's okay, we need, to, we need to have these conversations. But what we need to agree on is Satan's assault on the family. And what it looks like for us as uh, husbands and, and fathers, wives and mothers to... to occupy our primary vocation of passing on the faith to the next generation. We have such an individualistic, consumeristic, hedonistic culture, and it, this is what we swim in today, uh, that it takes great intention, and I commend you, brother, it takes great intention for a husband to lead uh, his wife and for a, a, a father to lead his family in the things of the Lord, connected to the never-changing uh doctrine that we have as Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod followers of, of Jesus. So no real question there. I'm just saying uh, I, the invitation would be whether you sing a hymn or you're singing, I guess, hopefully it's some, if it's a modern instrumentation song, um, hopefully it has a good theology. Regardless, we need to sing. We're walking through the Psalms right now, the prayer book of the Bible. You you mentioned it. And in, just yesterday I preached on Psalms in the summer is kind of our the Pentecost series right now that we're walking through. But Psalm 145 was a Psalm that in the Jewish home, they said at morning, noon, and night, um, and it is just a psalm of praise, a psalm of praise. Uh, gratitude changes the the heart. So uh, all that to say, 
thank you for what you're doing um, and and passing on the faith. Could you get a little bit more, like if you were to give, because this is something that's ingrained in your home, um, and I'm, I'm way into holy habits, right? Habits mm-hmm. kind of form, the intentions of our home kind of form our head and our hearts, right? So what would you, what word of instruction would you give to maybe even a pastor or a leader who says, whoa, I have... I got an opportunity now to make some changes by the power of the Holy Spirit. What would you tell uh, he or she as they lead their home? What's one or two like good first steps for leading their kids or maybe even their grandkids closer mm-hmm. to the Lord, setting up those disciplines? Yeah, so as far as pastors go, what I've developed here, what I've done here is that I actually lead a devotion with the kids in front of the Bible class after church every Sunday. And so we have a very well attended Bible class and the kids all line up on the, on the side and I lead a devotion. We, um, and again, I don't do it in this, like, Hey, we're going to go through matins from the hymnal. It is rather right. informal. It's like, Hey, what'd you hear about the gospel? Kind of like a little children's sermon. What commandment does that have to do with? Um, oh, it's the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And they recite that. And then we sing a hymn and we say a prayer. And uh, then I can tell uh, the families, hey, you can do this every day at home. So they actually mm-hmm. see it and mm-hmm. see that it is rather stress-free. Um, mm-hmm. The other thing to stress to people is that what you do in church, you're going to do at home and vice versa. And a lot of times people aren't singing at home we're reading at home and so forth because church becomes just this like function that you go to. And it's, it's actually a little scary if you were to look out at your typical LCMS congregation and see how many people aren't singing or participating mm. during a service. Um, so you just kind of have people with their arms crossed and, uh, <laughs> And, and I, I, I try to sit when I'm not leading a service, I try to sit in the front so I don't have to see it. <laughs> you know, if you sit in the back of the church, you can see all these people just not participating. And in, mm. in particular, when you see fathers not participating because, oh, I don't know how to sing. Well, God, God loves your voice, uh, whether you know how to yes. sing or not. Um, my mother, um, and I know my, my last name is Preuss, and so that's what people talk about, but really... Um, my, my mother is my inspiration for a lot of things. And my mother um, would sing boldly and constantly and loudly and uh, was so happy to be a Christian all the time. And she didn't have the, she doesn't have, she didn't have the best, you know, pitch and so forth. And when we would get older and get all sensitive about this and be like, you know, mom, you should have started on a C and not a B. She'd say, oh, stop that. God loves to hear us sing, right? Um, And that's the kind of attitude uh, that uh, that we need. It's like, fathers, your your kids are looking. So sing, pay attention, Mm -hmm. um, care about it, and it will get handed down. You don't have to worry about the details. You don't have to, you know, dress up and put your robes on and, uh, you know, uh, be all ridiculously pious with a hymnal. You don't need to do everything formally, especially at home. Um, it will become natural to you once you do it in church. And also when you do it in church too, you start encouraging everyone else around yes. you. And you see what the family of God uh, can actually do and sound like. Mm. What is it about singing, man? That just, I can't sing and be grumpy. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. I mean, I could sing a secular song and, and be grumpy for sure or angry, but singing the the hymns of the church, uh, and we have modern instrumentation here, but we're very, we're very conservative in, in terms of song selection. We're actually writing a number of modern instrument oh. uh, songs right now for the church with solid theology for those of us who may have a more modern contemporary. But regardless, uh, I love to sing. I love to sing. It does something. So when I lose my, one of my biggest fears, Christian, is losing my voice. And it's, yes, because our vocation, one of our, is Office of Holy Ministry preaching and that, and I, that concerns me, but just what it would do to my heart if I weren't able to, to sing in my car, shower out into the body of, body of Christ. What is it about men, dude, that it's like, where does this come from that men are so stoic and kind of reserved 
um, especially as it comes to singing and maybe even speaking the faith. Let's just start uh, with some encouragement uh, for for men, especially our husbands and fathers. What is it about that, man? Where'd that come from? You know, that, that's a great question. And I don't know if I know the answer. What I can tell you is, I mean, what you said, hey, Christian, that looks really uh, old fashioned. And it is old fashioned what we do at home. But when we say it's old fashioned, we, we got to realize that this actually prevailed, this sort of Christian culture. A dad, you know, whether he's got his banjo at home or he, he's just singing, he's leading his, 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 his house and singing, not just, not just religious songs, but also, uh, you know, secular songs. Um, like you can watch the old um, Westerns. And what do the cowboys do? These are the manliest men in the world, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have to say that because I'm from Wyoming, right? Uh, <laughs> they're, they're around the fire singing. Now, what happens is you have uh, first the radio come in and um, then, uh, you know, TV and, and so forth. And people, instead of being their own singers, getting their own, uh, you know, producing their own entertainment and it being uh, localized, um, they get all of it from the radio and then the TV. And then they start thinking of it as a specialization. Mm-hmm. And that's always dangerous. So, oh, that person sings because that person is a singer. Um, and this over specialization then um, will also apply to what you just said uh, to speaking the word of God, right? Oh, that's for pastors, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so we have to get rid of the idea that. Only if you're a specialist can you talk on, or an expert can you talk on God's word. Only if you're an expert or a specialist can you sing and so forth. And frankly, a big part of that is going to be us separating ourselves, not in the sense of separating ourselves completely from the world, but from the constant barrage of media um, and instead focusing much more on locality and home. And yeah, that's, that's different. Um, but it wasn't, the, it wasn't different for like, you know, 6,000 years of human history. <laughs> <laughs> Just the way things have changed, man, in our generation. Cause how old are you? Are you 30, what, five, six, seven? What are you? 37. Yep. Seven. Yeah. I'm 40, 41. Like the level of distraction for, or, or lack of distraction from our youth I think our kids have a hard time understanding how much things have changed and how just at the, you know, click of a something on your you can find whatever you want. I I read an article a bit ago about how the world changed with the telegraph. Have you heard about that? Oh yeah. So we be, yep. Yeah, I mean that was you talked the radio, but you can go even back further to like the yeah. telegraph, right? I mean, we at that point we're able to consume information that didn't pertain to our unique context, right? That wasn't Correct. beyond my neighborhood or beyond my maybe ch- church family or small small town. We took in way more. And man, the damage it has done to, I would say, the faith. We want to now know and control and what sells is anger and fear. And we as as church leaders, as I'm, I'm, we're both going to be at the convention how much of that information or disinformation or the caricature of which we put on different people, you know, how much does that like taint? We, we move right into the political polarization of this day and age with just uh, clickbait and the anger and, and all of that. I'm making some very absolutely. general statements, but I think all of that informs the way we disciple by the power of the spirit connected to the word, our kids to pass on the faith. So I think I almost go to the, Lamentations. We just kind of have to sit in the lament of where we are, but but the gospel doesn't keep us there, does it? <laughs> Jesus no. still is calling us. The fields are ripe under the harvest. So the question is that that balance between in the world and not of the world. I think that's a helpful. I mean, you got the Apostle Paul, right, Christian, who says became all things to all people, you know, mm-hmm. be well thought of by outsiders, do nothing mm-hmm. to kind of discount the gospel. And yet at the very same time, like he's speaking strong words. I'm thinking first Corinthians uh, about the church and, and her lack of morality and things like that. Mm-hmm. So uh, talk about how we walk that tension as the local church in the world, but, but not of the world Christian. How do you articulate that? 
Yeah. So first, just to um, piggyback on what you were saying about um, so much toxicity on the internet and so forth and how we can so easily make people into our enemies who are our brothers. Um, this is a problem and it, it does have to do with us not meeting face to face. So yes. again, it has to do with locality. So once I get to know Tim and I've had a beer with Tim or a glass of wine with Tim or have this conversation with him and meet his children and his wife and see how he loves them and so forth, I don't then get to go and trash him. Um, I might disagree with him on things and bring those to him and Mm -hmm. have an argument based on God's word. Uh, But the more we actually interact with actual people, the less we're going to be able to simply demonize them, right? So if I were to bring up a specific that I, um, you know, disagree with where uh, 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 CTX has gone as far as separating from uh, the synod. However, it is not my... Uh, it is not my Christian impulse to then uh, say that uh, President Christian, he's got an awesome last name, um, is a <laughs> devil and has no good That's intentions right. whatsoever in what he's doing. We don't get right. to do that. We don't get to um, turn people into devils and then talk about them in smoke filled rooms, right? Mm. Um, uh, while we never actually talk to them face to face. And so let me just pause right there, Christian. Yeah, I I think that behavior has been accepted in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod generally. And I think our generation of those of us who are in unique context, we we have to set a new way of having these conversations face to face, because Mm -hmm. I think there's caricatures of people and problems that are not entirely not entirely true. Um, I also lament that CTX is pulling out of Synod. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I interviewed them and asked them a number. I don't know if you watched the interview, but asked them a I number did. of of kind of what I tried to be as gracious and pointed as possible with some of the questions and, and collegial and, and kind. Um, and I, I still don't understand all of the details about how that all went down. And I have to say, I, I'm a... I'm a family systems guy, so I release, and we we talked about that. So I release kind of controlling that problem to the Lord and to the church, to the wider wider community. But when I'm with them, I just want to listen and love and try to learn. And then and then if I have to, like J. O. Price says, disagree agreeably, we do so, right? So mm-hmm. um, I, I just wish for, and I pray we can start to model that in the way we. Uh, talk to one another at synod and and convention. So, um, yeah. Anything else though? That that's great. I pray that that permeates throughout our synod. But then anything else? Just as we try to do work in our various contexts. I don't know, Christian, that we have fully wrapped our heads around how diverse the American landscape is, and and various congregations find themselves. Because Casper is very different than than Gilbert. And, and Phoenix, kind of our ur- urban ministry is different than Casper or rural ministry. And how do we sit and just kind of live in that and, and identify the differences of doing pastoral ministry in those various contexts and what needs to kind of be what mm-hmm. holds us, grounds us together. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, and I think that's when we move into the conversation of theology and, and practice mm-hmm. and really starting to figure out what that means in this secular post-Christian day and age in which we live. So walk into that tension, if you would, about being in the world and not of the world. Yeah. So the being in the world and not of the world, first of all, has to do with doctrine. That is that we we simply do not compromise on our doctrine uh, ever um, for the sake of pleasing the world. And so that means we're going to hold fast to the scriptures and the Lutheran confessions. And we're going to see as we do so that it can be very painful because we do live in the world. Um, So the roles of women, for example, in the world, um, which we into it because we live in this world, are going to be different from the uh, roles of women uh, within the church. So how do we navigate that? Well, we go to the scriptures. We go to what the Bible actually tells us. And we go to a clear scripture too. That's something that we all uh, need to confess uh, boldly is that the Bible is clear and that we can confidently discuss it with one another in Christian love. 
Um, so I, I brought up the, the issue of women's roles because it's just very obvious. Um, but we could go to things that are even uh, more obvious, and that would be like uh, uh, the acceptance of homosexual marriage, uh, uh, the, the acceptance of homosexuality in general uh, in our society, which you see in every commercial and so forth. Um, that cannot bleed into the doctrine of the church, uh, or for that matter, its practice. Now, things get far more complicated uh, when you start talking about practice, and that's always been the case. This is one of the greatest controversies in the early uh, Lutheran church. After Martin Luther dies, Emperor Charles V uh, heads into uh, Germany. He takes it over, and he imposes uh, what's called the Augsburg Interim, uh, later turned into the Leipzig Interim, and most uh, Lutherans um, compromised. So what they did is they said, okay, we'll worship as Roman Catholics because otherwise the emperor is going to shut us down or kill us. And there was one city that refused to do so, and its printing press just went wild, printing book after book after book, saying, this is wrong, guys. We can't compromise at all, not, not just in doctrine, but we can't compromise in practice. And that city was Magdeburg. Magdeburg um, withstood a a year-long siege, I think it was 400 days, and actually prevailed and convinced its brothers, uh, fellow cities and so forth with an appeal uh, to um, aid them and not um, and stand up, right? Because at that time, if the Roman Catholic uh, uh, Pope tells you that you're supposed to lift up the host or lift up uh, the chalice, he's telling you to um, he, he's telling you to show the people that hmm. uh, you're supposed to sacrifice the mass or yeah, allegiance. if you wore a chasuble. Um, hmm. So that's the, the pretty looking thing that some of us wear. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know why other people wear it, but I just wear it because it's pretty. Um, but if you wore a chasuble <laughs> back then. Well, the celebrant, just a pause right there. The celebrant normally wears a chasuble, right? In some correct. of our churches. Right? Correct. Yeah, exactly. Good. The celebrant. And it the is sacrament. pretty. It is pretty, Christian. It's, it's very pretty. It's pretty, yeah. <laughs> It's more color, right? It, it really tells color, you yeah. what uh, what yeah. uh, or what part of the church you're you're in. Uh, right. But back then, it meant you uh, um, you, you know you were uh, bound by the Pope and so forth. And so the Lutherans said, "We're not going to wear it because you told us we had to." Things like that. And guys like Matthias Flacius, uh, Nicholas von Amstorf, they argued very uh, stridently and correctly. Uh, and the formula of Concord ends up uh, agreeing, and I think it's formula of Concord 10, um, mm -hmm. uh, with them, that uh, doctrine and practice belong together. Mm -hmm. um, that what, how you practice reflects um, how you, uh, uh, reflects what you believe. So this is- And in uh, that old... story, in that story, Christian, it was a differentiate between Lutheran practice and Roman Catholic practice, just to be clear for folks Absolutely. that are listening. Right? Exactly. They did not Those want forms to give, had meaning. Meaning, exactly. You did not want to give the impression that you were sacrificing the mass. You did not want to give the impression that you were uh, under the Pope's uh, divine power, uh, divine authority. You did not want to give the impression that something like purgatory existed, right? Um, and so, prayers for the saints were impossible. Um, sacrificing the mass for the dead was impossible. And so they said, okay, fine, you don't have to sacrifice the mass, but everything has to look like it. <laughs> and the Lutherans, most Lutherans said, okay, okay. And Flacius and Amsdorf and this whole city of, of Magdeburg said, no way, no. How we practice matters. So then the question becomes, um, you know, how do we apply that to our day? And uh, this yes. is where of the world, uh, or in the world, but not of the world, um, would come to apply. And I mean, my argument, my practice uh, is to keep with the traditional Lutheran liturgy, liturgy. hymnody, um, historic lectionary, so forth and so on. Um, because uh, I believe that it most reflects uh, the doctrine that is going on. So if there's a lot of reverence surrounding the, the uh, consecration of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, then it gives people that beautiful impression, truth, 
that something holy and wonderful is happening here, that the, and, mm-hmm. and, and that they should come reverently to the altar to receive the body and blood of Jesus to their, for their forgiveness of their sins. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, that's where the modern debate uh, comes to the fore, is how well is our practice reflecting our, our doctrine? Yeah. Do you think that debate mostly hinges around uh, the liturgy and and worship in general, the week in week out? Do you think do you think that's where we're living right now, or do you think there's other themes? Because I'd I'd love to talk about that. That'd be fantastic. But are there other places too where you think we need to be more aligned as it relates to to the practice of the church? So. Yeah, I think that's the, where it's most manifest. I think it's uh, yeah. because it's just, it's just obvious that if you come to my church, an, uh, mm-hmm. you're going to have a certain kind of worship, right? We sing, we mm-hmm. sing Bach and um, mm-hmm. we have an organ, right? And everyone's vested mm-hmm. and everything is reverent and um, uh, in line with what Lutherans have done for uh, 500 years. Um, and yeah. if you go elsewhere in the LCMS, uh, it might look much more like... Uh, uh, what you'd see at a non-denom- non-denominational church in my city. So we simply yeah. have a manifestation yeah. of uh, differing practice. It's very easy to see. Um, but no, I think in the end, we have to rally around and actually have conversations on, on doctrine. Um, because I think the, mm-hmm. um, I, I think the differing practices do reflect how we think about God's word. Um, and the more honest and uh, yeah. disagreeing agreeably, uh, arguing from God's word um, with brothers as brothers uh, that we do, the better. And so I really commend you actually for having uh, these podcasts and um, talking with so many different kinds of people um, on these podcasts mm-hmm. to get these conversations started. Let's, let's go, man. I, I love it. So where in scripture... Just to let folks know my context, I, I preached four times yesterday. Uh, two of them, two of them were in a much more high church traditional organ, and then two of them were in a more modern space uh, with an altar, but there's drums off, you know, that kind of a thing, and and singing what I would argue are theologically sound songs uh, to the Lord, and and uh, all of them are tethered with the traditional historic liturgy from the invocation to the benediction. Um, My context here, there are so many, we're not in competition with evangelical America per se, but I am surrounded by a ridiculous amount of non-denom churches and they, they're, they're not non-denom. They either are coming from a Southern Baptist kind of bent. They've just branded kind of non-denom or uh, hyper-Calvinist teaching their um, Reformed churches. So those are the two different extremes. And and so one of our, you know, recognizing our context, we are not compromising from Confession, Absolution, Lord's Supper, Prayers of the Church, Apostles, Nicene Creed, etc. Obviously inviting the Triune God to be present in our worship, leaving with the presence of God in the Aaronic Benediction, not compromising there. And the word that is preached, law gospel-centered word that is preached, is the exact same in both of those contexts. Uh, But my conscience is not crippled because of diverse instrumentation. I think that's where we kind of have to go. Can we organize ourselves around a shared liturgy, you know, um, and at the same time recognize that, and I, I don't, I'm a historian, and I didn't know 20 years ago, Christian, because of the context that I was in, that a lot of this music was coming out of, you know, the charismatic movement. And I'll, I'll give you that for sure, that the the roots of this came out of the Amy Grant and um, what happened in Southern California, the Jesus culture stuff, you know. So there is that strain. And we were, some of us, uh, changed. And, and some of our traditions, our practices were shaped in, in that way. That doesn't mean it's entirely bad, but we must be cognizant of where it came from. And and I the older I get, bro, the more I'm leaning toward tradition and hymns. And, you know, if we're going to sing a new song, it's going to be really, really solid. Like the more I'm drawn back 
toward what I think are some of the values that that you have. I don't want to show, man. Like that's the worst thing you can possibly imagine for people to come and entertain me, tell another joke, you know, whatever. Like that's but I am I am also by nature we're going to know one another. I'm a little bit more gregarious, I'm an extrovert. I you know, yeah. winsome characteristics, all of those behaviors. So I want to be Orthodox confessional Lutheran, uh, third generation LCMS guy, right? Well, at the same time uh, saying, well, we have some some diverse practices here and we're trying to steward them faithfully, specifically around the the shared liturgy that's found in in uh, our hymnal as as well as found within scripture i would say so anything to add toward that kind of you hear me just wrestling with that tension christian just where i've come from what i've lived in and how yep. i still think there's room for me within the lutheran church missouri synod and obviously for you as well well so i i think it's uh, what are your thoughts i i think it's beautiful uh what you just said um and that um uh, you know a, a lot of people on so my side of the um, debate in the LCMS, uh, would just assume that anyone who, um, well, I shouldn't say this about my brothers, but, um, they might assume, um, that anyone who's doing contemporary, uh, worship, um, is, you know, like wants that, wants, and, and, and sort of despises the old traditional, uh, liturgy and so forth. And that's, um, you know, usually not the case. Right. Um, and as, as you just confessed, like you right. value the tradition, um, and, and realize that certain aspects too, of the, uh, of the liturgy are simply, um, uh, indispensable. Now, um, what mm -hmm. I would do is just try to work you toward realizing that the entire liturgy is indispensable, <laughs> but, um, at the same time, I recognize that there are different contexts, uh, that people come into, um, I was just talking to a friend recently who came into a, uh, a congregation where he had, uh, a homosexual, uh, elders, uh, homosexuals, uh, you know, belonging to the church, totally close, uh, totally open communion, um, and, uh, all sorts of other things. And, um, he changed a lot of it right off the bat. But there are certain things that he lived with for four or five years as he tried to improve, um, uh, just because you've got 20 things to change. And, um, you know, one thing that I might as an outsider say, hey, why didn't you change that? That's wrong. Um, if I actually got to know the man and see what he was mm -hmm. struggling with in his context, um, I would realize that, you know, he's probably braver and more orthodox than I am. So the <laughs> this can often this can often happen. Um mm -hmm. The, uh, what we're getting at though, when it comes to, uh, sort of the, uh, contemporary worship, um, songs and so forth, um, is two things. One is the objectivity of, uh, beauty, the objectivity of music, you could say, and what music mm. does. Um, the other is, uh, what the role mm -hmm. of the pastor is in, an, in a congregation, um, you know, uh, I should say in the divine service, is he actually supposed to be leading it? And th so these, these do come down to doctrinal mm -hmm. issues that we can, uh, th that we can talk about. Um, so the one, the objectivity sure. of beauty that is that, and the objectivity of music, that music does certain things to certain people. I was just, uh, fishing with, um, one of my, um, uh, catechumens. He's an a, a adult convert. Um, and, uh, I tried and failed to spend like five hours catechizing him while catching walleye, but we caught 16 walleye. So it was a good day <laughs> and we had some good conversations. Congrats. That's awesome. But we were listening to some uh, Christian uh, rock on the way home just because we were going through the, going through the stations. And I pointed out to him, so yeah. you take uh, Creed, um, which everybody, I think they were a Christian Creed. rock band. Um, so I Back just the heard day. the news today. <laughs> It seems my life is going to change. And you know what's going to happen. You know that it's going to elevate to this unbelievably emotional um, chorus, right? With arms wide open, right? Where you just let everything out. 
Okay. Um, and then it turns out you turn to every Creed song and that's exactly what happens. Um, and it'll happen with most um, contemporary uh, Christian songs where you get this kind of soft, 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 then boom, just exuberance. You let it all out. And then you compare it to uh, most hymns like in the LSB and you'll see that that music, uh, while it will allow you certain just rejoicing elements, Emotion never lets emotions. you just mm -hmm. go full out. And there's a reason for that. That's the point. And it's not just a cultural reason. It's not just because they were Germans, right? Or Norwegians and mm -hmm. they didn't like fun or exuberance. It's that uh, Lutherans recognize that the emotions are a beautiful thing, but they also need to be tamed. And that's why, as you pointed out, a lot of the um, Christian music that got adopted by Lutheran churches came out of the Pentecostal movement uh, and the non-denom movement, which has a fundamentally different theology and which allows that emotionalism to uh, over-assert uh, itself. So it's a good... Mm. It's, it's simply a good conversation to have. And this actually gets yeah. us to classical education, yeah. right? Because yeah. these are the things you discuss in classical education is the objectivity of certain things like beauty um, and, and music. Mm -hmm. The other concern that um, the uh, more liturgical bent uh, in the LCMS would have is that uh, a pastor actually um, lead the service and not, uh, as you said before, like a praise band. So it just becomes uh, entertainment. Um, and that also then would include, right, uh, the practice of closed communion, uh, that the body and blood of Jesus is given to those who know what they're taking and who are not then going to uh, commune at another altar next Sunday that denies uh, the, the, the real presence of Jesus' holy body and blood. Ah, so much there. So, to yeah, and emotional... I thought we were talking about the college. <laughs> oh well, we're, yeah. I guess we can get there. This has been fun, bro. This has been fun. But yeah, we'll, we'll get there. That's the next point. But um, I just wanted to agree with you around emotionalism and the church and creating. And I kind of was just talking about this when, like, why do you come to worship? I, do I come to? Because I could lean into this, like, I. You know, I pre you talked about before you got preaching or without notes, right? With what you learned from Poppy, I can I can get up there and give a twenty to thirty minute sermon, law gospel, that leads people on these various arcs. And the emotions, what I hear you say, the emotions aren't necessarily bad. No. Where we are feeling things, desiring things. It's just our desires are misoriented after the gods of this age, and so. Um, so just speak to that. I mean, cause you, you see in the Psalms, all the emotions from David and the psalmist, right? The yes. good, the bad, and the ugly, the highs and the lows. I will praise you loud singing. You know, I mean, there's, there's places there, but it just needs to be what I hear you saying. It needs to be stewarded. Maybe that's a good stewarded toward the things of God rather than, recognizing, and this is deep theology, rather than recognizing God is near to me when I feel him, mm -hmm. when I feel his, his presence. No, God is, God is near to you because he has brought you near. He has claimed you in the waters of baptism. It's his work drawing you near, not you toward, toward him. Is that, is that a fair assessment of the emotional conversation, Christian? Yeah, no, that's great. That's exactly right. Um, so on the one side, you will have people um, who like despise any sort of like emotion and exuberance and you can fall off, right? The donkey on the wrong side, right? And it can That's go good. either way. Um, so we should have exuberance. We should have excitement. We should have joy as uh, we're, joy. We're Christians. Jesus is risen from the dead. Um, we know Amen. our creator. I mean, it's just simply <laughs> wonderful to be a Christian. We should be excited. And um, yes. that's the way I sing my hymns, right? Um, the distinction that, uh, you just made, uh, is the one between, is there like an objective truth outside of me that determines all of this, or is it just how I feel? And what you had in the like second great awakening, um, to go further back into history in the 19th century, um, is you had people basing it all on their feelings and they get all these revelations and so forth. And then the word of God gets set aside. The Holy scriptures get set aside in favor of 
how I'm feeling. And that's what we want to avoid. And that's why um, it can be very dangerous to allow the emotions to end up dominating uh, in our music uh, or in our church uh, services. But at the same time, we absolutely, uh, you know, like, you know, the old pictures from the Bronze Age of the Missouri Synod that you see in all of these LCMS churches where the confirmants are not smiling and neither is the pastor. Yeah. It's like, it's a very sin. stoic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be very dangerous also, like it stinks to be a Christian. Um, and so we want, we want exuberance. We want excitement. Uh, um, but the question, uh, the, the question is how best do we, do we um, tame the emotions and mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so steward them and guide them so as to be in line with God's word. And that mm. is, you know, a, a conversation that we should continue to have. A basic distinction that has been taught for a very long time um, is that between the Apollinarian and the Dionysian, uh, like style of music. And the the Dionysian, you know, who Dionysus is, right? He's the god mm -hmm. of he's the mm -hmm. god of wine and of orgies and so forth. It's just mm -hmm. pure exuberance, just let it all out. And this is what you see in a lot of uh, rock and roll music, right? Which is, of course, the, and, and pop music, which is the sort of music that um, most contemporary worship draws from. Though there are others. I mean, you can have some pretty tame music in like, uh, um, you know, like country and so forth. Um, but then on the other side, you have the Apollinarian, which is just uh, f far more uh, control, self-control mm -hmm. uh, of the music and, and of emotions uh, generally. So that's, that, is, that is the theological issue uh, behind the argument. <clears throat> oh, man, we, we are going to have to chat again, bro. And not in the near, but hopefully I, I would love to call you a, a friend and a brother because we have so many points of alignment uh, as it relates to the gods of this of this age, that we yeah. are the hedonistic gods of this age, that a lot of our people are are being um, impressed and and maybe manipulated by, um, and they do go back to a lot of the pagan pagan gods. But we're gonna we're gonna shelve that one for another <laughs> another time, and let's lean into. So you you gave a speech which I listened to. And um, it was around the Concordia University system and specifically what what pinged the consciences and what got me uh, to reach out to you was was two things. One saying that our Concordia universities had mission drift because they welcomed. So these are the two main issues because they welcomed kind of outsiders. And then we see kind of the, the shift from maybe formation of uh, the theology students, pre-sem, teachers, the like, to a wider group of, of outsiders, you could say, that were impressing, um, moving maybe our Concordias away, and these are very general statements, away from our common confession as Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. So that that is uh, the one one question. Um, and then, then just your response— um, and I, I have, we're doing competency-based theological education here. We're running a test that we'd love people to, to observe many of the classical classical uh, expressions that you have in your context are here, but you also are, are setting up a, a college, a, a Lutheran classical college. I'd love to love to hear more about, about that. But what would you say to those who say, we haven't, gosh, Christian, I mean, this is super harsh. Like all of our schools from the beginning, existed as missional entities. You, you probably know this right at the very beginning from Walther and others. Like the church, to be a Lutheran church, Missouri Synod congregation, you have to have a school. And that yeah. school is going to be made up of, of outsiders, pre-Christians, those who are on the way to Jesus. These are, these are mission-oriented entities. Um, so what would you say to those who, who say, man, from the very get-go, this has been about mission. How could you say we have a mission drift, bro? That's pretty harsh. <laughs> what would you say to that? I call it a mission shift. Uh, okay, not a drift. Okay, mission yeah, shift. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Fair enough. But um, the so, so first off, I, I think we just need to uh, learn our history. Um, uh, we did start LCMS schools um, with like every congregation. In fact, there were more schools than congregations, um, but they were not actually um, there for uh, outsiders. They were there for our. our our, our families. So just as the Concordias uh, were formed 
in order to um, produce pastors and um, teachers and so forth, and were originally exclusively for uh, Lutherans. That was the same thing with our uh, parochial schools. All of them were uh, instituted first and foremost for the raising of our own children, the education of our own children. You're not saying that those schools wouldn't offer education to those members or those who were not members. That's not what you're saying, is it? I mean, sometimes they wouldn't. Yeah, that's correct. So it's okay. founding. I'd love for uh, you to, I'd love for you to talk with my friend, Ryan Bredo, um, who's done a lot of work on the history and he, you'd, you'd enjoy him. You guys are, you'd get along great, but he just has a different perspective of the, the culture of our schools given that time. So could you cite like where, if people wanted to dig into this on their own, where did you get a lot of that research that kind of says our schools were for Lutherans only? That's a good question. Um, you know how you're just, read and then uh you get facts <laughs> Where in your did this head come from? and then you you yeah you've read too many books it's okay it's okay. um so i i can't give you uh a citation on that um and i what i'm not saying is that all these lutheran schools that were started in the 19th century uh said no you can't come unless you're a lutheran um i am saying that some did and i'm also saying that the reason they were formed was for their own children. Um, so schools were simply envisioned differently than we in the uh, at the latter half of the 20th century and the 21st century see them. And again, this has to do with um, this, this has to do with our context, right? <laughs> yeah. It, we, we we see LCMS schools that are majority non-Lutheran. This is what we see, and we see. Um, that uh, they can work to bring people into the church. It happens. And whenever that happens, it's an absolutely beautiful thing. Thank God for it every single time. Um, my point is simply that uh, the original foundation of these, church, uh, of, of these schools in the 19th century and early 20th century, uh, they were conceived, including the Concordias, uh, as by Lutherans and for Lutherans. And... Uh, people coming in from outside, if they came to the school, it would have been missionary. However, it would have been like, hey, you're taking catechesis at our, at our, um, at our uh, uh, congregation and your kids are going to the school and so forth. In other words, the end, the end goal even that would have been, let's, let's bring them into the fold. Um, what we have now, why I call it a, uh, a shift, is that it's simply not the reason um, for the existence of, uh, it's not the stated reason anymore for the existence of most of the Concordias. Seward still uh, produces most of our church workers, um, 60% undergraduate um, Lutheran population, I believe, uh, 90% Lutheran uh, faculty, full-time faculty. Um, and so, and if you look at its website, you'll see that they're very much um, their original mission oriented. And I did point that out um, in the speech that I gave. Uh, but if you look at all the other websites, you'll see that there has been a shift from what they factually, historically, originally did. Uh, and that was to raise up uh, church workers. And the shift now is to uh, be much more um, uh, missional, that is, invite all sorts of other people in. Um, and uh, th that, that aren't Lutheran. So that's, a that's just, a, that's just a factual statement of, of, of the, of the drift or the shift that has happened yeah. in our Concordia. And yeah. the question is how sustainable is it? And that's what the 703, which apparently is now the 704, uh, task right. force. Um, that's, that's, Part 703 of is CTX. 703 is uh, the conversation with Concordia, Texas. Oh, and okay. I guess the CUS got moved to 704, whatever. So both huh. of them will be interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> whatever. Boy. So, so go ahead. Uh, finish your statement. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. It's I now think, 704. Yeah. So, um, the, I, I don't think that what I said should come off as harsh. Um, it's, it's factual. The facts can be, can, can seem harsh. It's, a, it's like uh, John 660. It was a hard word, right? And then Jesus disciples, uh, most of them leave, them, away. right? Scleros logos. Um, so the facts can seem hard sometime, um, but I wasn't, I was purposely not trying to just um, throw the Concordias under the bus. Um, 
I was just trying to point out a fact, uh, and that is that all of them were formed with a specific mission, and that mission uh, for most of them now uh, has has changed. Um, so, so yeah, if you were to if you were to look at Concordia, Texas, for example, um, its main focus is simply not uh, the formation of pastors and teachers. Its main focus is not to attract uh, Lutherans, and you can tell that by the um, you can tell that by the student population, the programs and so forth. Mm -hmm. And they would readily admit mm -hmm. that, but that's not their main, they're, they're, that's not their main mission anymore. Um, so there, yeah. there simply has been a shift um, and pointing it out, getting it out in the open and then just saying, um, is this a good shift? Is this a bad shift? What does it do to us financially? Mm -hmm. uh, who does it make mm -hmm. us depend on? Um, does it have anything to do with the closing of three Concordias and the one having to um, take on the administration of another. Um, and my answer to that is yes, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. So I, uh, I, I don't want uh, like the founding of Luther Classical College um, to be conceived in any way as a, a um, protest um, against the mm -hmm. Concordias. Um, I want it to be instead looked at as a positive formation of what uh, people are asking for um, and desiring uh, in our context and in our day. And that is a classical Lutheran education that simply is by Lutherans and for Lutherans and isn't offered elsewhere uh, at this time. Yeah. So two, two maybe three things. Uh, we were rem a remarkably more Christian nation in the mid 19th century. Yeah. <laughs> right. So the amount of uh, non-Lutherans or maybe even non-Christians that would come into a number of our schools be far less than the percentage today, just given the demographic shift and the decline in American Christianity and, and in Lutheranism today. So that's, that's mm -hmm. fair, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's though. What I would point out there, ahead. uh, is something that, uh, uh, Dr. Ferry actually pointed out in one of your, one of your talks with him. Mm -hmm. And that is that the number of, uh, Lutherans really hasn't changed uh, at, uh, you know, Concordia, Wisconsin or Concordia, Nebraska. Same thing with uh, my alma mater, uh, Bethany Lutheran College. The number of Lutherans really hasn't changed. What's the happened- The amount of students? Is the amount of students. In other words, yeah. the universities have grown. They've gotten really, 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 really big. Um, I mean, not in comparison to like a state school, but they've gotten really, really, right. really big. And that's another part of the shift. Yeah. Um, so- we need to talk about formation of church workers right now. We would, I, would I, let's get to data here. One of my primary objections to, I, I have no issue with set apart to serve and the work that's going on by the synod to raise up more church workers, pastors, teachers, DCs, etc. Where my struggle is, is the demographic or the lack of clarity on what the church needs now and what the church is going to need, say, a decade from now, not just to sustain, get pastors and pulpits to proclaim law and gospel, not just to sustain or maybe revitalize future churches, um, but also to start new new churches. I see no data coming out. And you're Christian, this is going to be your first time at Synod and Convention. I would love to have more clarity. And I don't think there's nothing nefarious, but that's just not been the top priority um, in terms of telling the story of our declining denomination right now. And here's here's kind of the, the big driver for me. I really believe the world needs confessional Lutheranism now more than ever. You know what I'm saying? Amen. I really, be I really, I really believe our churches <laughs> should be concerned with raising up the next generation of of church leaders, from pastors, etc. We need more Orthodox Lutheran teachers in our schools. Like, there's a major epidemic of of the pipeline is not what we need, and I just don't see the clarity with what we have now and what we're going to need into the future. Any response to that, though, Christian? Yeah. Well, so. Whenever you're, you're, you're marketing and trying to say, hey, everything's good, everything's good, because you don't want people to uh, you know, freak out and, uh, and jump ship, uh, you end up covering up uh, data that really should be talked about. And that's part of the reason that I gave the talk that I talked. We just need it out in the open, and we need to actually talk about the, the, issues, uh, the issues that are confronting us. Um, yes. We need to have goals 
of planting new Lutheran congregations. We need Please. to have goals, not just of sustaining like what we have now at St. Louis and Fort Wayne. I think they're getting around 40 for a good class, but of growing that, right? And that means that we can't be like, uh, oh, we just have to, we, we, we just have to preserve uh, this Concordia, that Concordia and so forth. We have to actually be working to say, no, not only preserving, we can't, we can't just be defensive and reactive. We have to Please. be proactive and say, we need to raise as many church workers uh, as are competent, right? And know their stuff and are excited and zealous about spreading the kingdom because we have the truth and the people yes. really, really, really need to hear it and they want to hear it. And that's mm. what uh, I firmly believe that uh, liturgical confessional Lutheranism has enormous power and potential to capture the hearts of people who are lost in this world. And that what we need is young men who are, uh, and as, as far as teachers and young women, very, and, and well, young men, young, young women who are going to be uh, raising families too, who are very yes. excited, right? Uh, Please, to yes. uh, cultivate this gospel and spread it. Um, and so we need that kind of attitude in our Concordias. We need it at Seminaries. our college, Luther Classical College. We need it everywhere. Yes. Okay. So this is our, we agree. The gospel should be propagated. <laughs> it should go forth <laughs> far and wide. Uh, that The teaching of the life, death, resurrection, ascension, the imminent return of Jesus, you know, the, the driver, the evangelical driver of people are walking in darkness in need of the light of Christ. And do we even believe hell is real, that it is reserved for Satan and his demons and for those that do not bend the knee to Jesus as King and Lord? Do we actually believe that? I, we, we must rally Christian in this day and age in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, upon on that common confession of with the early church, Jesus is Lord and there is no other. And that needs to, that needs to move from our homes out into our communities in a more rapid way. And we need to, at the same time, the early church wrestles with this. How does the church organize herself uh, from apostles, prophets, Ephesians four type stuff, uh, the office of mm -hmm. Holy ministry, obviously the first Timothy kind of qualities, characteristics like we, these, these men are there. Let's just talk pastoral ministry. I believe these men are there, um, but for a season, and this is a strategic season right now, as we kind of move on a new growth curve, I believe we need to talk more, Christian, about bivocational ministry, um, especially to serve some of our smaller congregations that can't afford a full-time pastor. And I don't think we're having that conversation um, right now and what it's going to take to to form them well for uh, a season. We uh, Paul was bivocational in many respects, but we have we've been blessed to be in a system where hey, you go through it and you get a full time full time call. Uh, for us to start and sustain current churches, I think we need to talk around bivo ministry and formation toward that end. Any thoughts there as we're coming down the home stretch? This has been fun. Yeah, this has been fun. Uh, I think uh, some form of bivocational uh, ministry, uh, at least in the interim, is going to be necessary. And if I could just uh, put a plug in, I don't think there's any better uh, way of doing that than uh, getting a classical education where you're competent in all sorts of things, uh, not just in preaching, not just being an app to teach, but you could also, you know, get a job um, while doing just about uh, anything, you know, marketing or communications or business or whatever, uh, because you're, you're generally competent. Um, yeah. And so that's what, that's what we have to be uh, looking for. Um, uh, in the future, I myself would like to see uh, the seminaries um, always involved in this. And I'd like to see the generosity of uh, the people of God um, to make it possible for people who know that they're not going to get paid full time uh, to still get a quality education and be apt to teach. Yes. Cool. So last question. Tell us about the Lutheran Classical College, your hopes, your goals. And for those who are listening, like I've heard of maybe classical conversations. I have a working knowledge of what classical education looks like, but my kids have not gone through it in the formal sense. So what is classical education and how should it shape formation of, of Lutheran leaders? Great. So Luther Classical started in 2025 here in Casper, Wyoming. 
Um, and uh, our, our dean's already here. We're going to be getting more professors and so forth. We have over 100 people uh, pre-enrolled um, already. Um, and uh, so we're very excited about the start of this college. Classical education, that means you're uh, going back to the sources. This is the mm -hmm. uh, rally cry Classics. of the Reformation, ad fontes, to the sources. So for example, if I could give you a couple classes. So let's say you're going to read you're going to study uh, biology. You're going to read Darwin's uh, um, what? Origin of the Species. You're going to read Darwin's or, Origin of the Species. Too. You're going to see 19th century uh, reactions to it. You're going to discuss from the actual uh, primary sources, uh, 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 you know, uh, the theory, its doctrine, its consequences, and so forth. Um, if you're going to be studying math, you're going to go to Euclid. Um, if you're going to be uh, studying um, uh, music, you're actually going to be, uh, you know, not not as they do at the University of Texas, uh, studying Taylor Swift, uh, but going back to uh, its <laughs> origins, um, the origins of uh, polyphony, um, and uh, uh, you know the the the, the great height of um, of music and and J.S. Bach. Um, you're going to learn history not from a textbook that tells you what to think about it, but rather from the actual sources. Um, and as as uh, so, like you're going to learn that Herodotus um, thinks that uh, everything is weird in uh, everything is the opposite. It's opposite world in Egypt, right? Mm. And so <laughs> the the women do what men do in Egypt, uh, and uh, we're and, living that today, bro. We're living that today, <laughs> exactly. We're exactly. So yeah. th this is the point. It gets you talking about all sorts of modern things, not just leaving you in the past, um, but you learn from the actual sources. You learn to you learn to speak. You learn to communicate. Um, so you actually have rhetoric classes. So it's all aimed to make someone generally educated and not simply a careerist based on some specialization, but rather widely educated in all sorts of fields. Um, and able to think and be a productive worker no matter what he or she ends up doing, um, plus a, an emphasis on church life and family life, which is so, so much needed in our day. What's the website if you want to check it out? Lutherclassical.org. And you, it's mostly BA, right? You have an AA and a BA, mm -hmm. a -A -A -A. kind of a pre-seminary potential Potential pre-seminary type of, uh, you're not so, looking to go masters or is it mostly no. going to stay BA? Yeah. No, there's, so there's only one major and that's how we keep it, um, you know, inexpensive. One major, 80% mm -hmm. of classes are taken in kind, but then there's four tracks. One is parish music. Uh, one is, um, classical education so to raise up teachers. Mm -hmm. One is cool. uh, pre-seminary. And then the other is the general track for anyone who just wants a liberal arts degree. Awesome. Awesome. Well, this has been fun, man. Uh, I'd love to love to have you back. And I pray that this conversation listener has helped you, one, yeah, identify some of the areas of, of conversation and maybe mild disagreement as we're trying to carry out our, our gospel mandate today, but that you have heard that, Christian, I care for you. I care for your family. I care for your congregation. I care for your context. And I care about the gospel going forth in Casper. And I, I imagine you'd probably say the same for me here in Gilbert. And and we just, we, we agree on the gospel of Jesus Christ. We agree that the authority, the only rule and source and norm is the word of God, the, the never changing word of God. And we agree on the master narrative. And we agree that with the sacraments, the baptism, the Lord's Supper, this is a big, this is a big deal. We took the same same oath, you know, we took the same covenant vows when we entered into this thing called pastoral ministry, and we take that very, very seriously. I, I agree that the Lutheran confessions, and not just documents, but the common confession norms us today as it's connected to the Word of God. So I hope you hear that there's a lot as we talk on this small little spectrum of missional to confessional. We're all missional. We're all confessional. Um, that yet that you just were comforted. We're gonna be. We're gonna be okay, regardless of who gets elected to this or that or the other. The, Jesus is Lord of the Church, and we need to go on mission. I think what we definitely agree on. We need to go on mission to raise up more workers for the harvest. Uh, it is plentiful, and when the workers are few, we need we need more. Any final comments, Christian? As we've closed today. No, I think you said it. 
let's plant some churches. I can't wait till there's a third one in Casper. <laughs> Amen. I love it. I love it. We'd like 20 here, actually, in the next 20 years. That's our that's our goal. So Jesus is Lord of the church. It's a good day. Go and make it a great day. Please like, subscribe, comment, wherever it is that you're taking in lead time. And we promise to have uh, challenging, hopefully joy-filled conversations with leaders in their local context looking to uh, multiply disciples uh, to spread the love and life of the risen and reigning Christ. We'll see you next week on Lead Time. Thanks so much, Christian. Thank you. You've been listening to Lead Time, a podcast of the Unite Leadership Collective. The ULC consults and brings together cohorts of congregations to build the culture, systems, and structures of intentional discipleship multiplication. To go deeper with us, create a free login on uniteleadership.org for access to exclusive materials and resources. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for next week's episode.